They say first impressions last a lifetime. Generally, when people hear this, they think that it means that when you meet somebody, the very first impression they have of you is what sticks, and they will forever measure you against that first impression. To an extent, this is true. But I interpret this in a different way. If you dig deeper and apply it to you, the big picture of your life, first impressions last forever. There's an old thing in psychology, I think it was around the 60s that these studies were developed, and the system was developed. The system's called PAC, uh, Transactional Analysis, or Parent Adult Child is the main concepts that it revolves around. And the basic idea goes as thus, that when you are born, there is a dual tape recording two strips, a dual tape. On one strip, it's recording all of your mental impressions that are being absorbed, everything you're experiencing, everything you're hearing and seeing. It's all being stored on a, on a mental cassette. And then there's your emotional impressions, which is how you feel about it, how you react to everything that's happening around you and all the emotional impressions. So from the day you're born, even maybe perhaps Prior to birth, it, I, it is possible to experience trauma before birth, at least on an emotional level. You start recording data on these two strips until the age of five. And I'm not sure of the exact in, ins and outs. You know, I'm not a, I don't understand the neurochemistry behind it or the biology behind it, but there's some part in the brain that allows one to be more rational or to be rational at all that develops from the age of five. So when a child turns five, there's a third element that is born, and that is the adult. So up until the age of five, we've been nothing but our emotional impressions and our mental impressions, which is your child and your parent, you know, your inner child and the parent, all the voices in your head stored from those that were raised you and your or, you know, everything that people told you when you were younger. So basically, from the age of five, you start becoming rational and the adult is born. And the adult's like a DJ, you know? He gets to look over the cassette tape of your emotional impressions recorded and your mental impressions recorded. And he gets to choose which ones he responds to. And if he doesn't want to respond to any of, you know, using any of those streams of thought or streams of feeling, he has the choice to be conscious about it and determine a new pathway, a new reaction or a new uh, possibility, a new choice. So the idea goes that when we're born, we are just recording information, recording, 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 emotionally, mentally, in our child and in our parent. And up until the age of five, the adult emerges, and that's when the freedom to analyze our feelings and analyze our child and analyze our thoughts and analyze our parent uh, comes about and we can actually be more aware when making our choices instead of just reacting like a child to our emotions or reacting you know, like a parent just to our immediate thoughts based on our conditioning, based on all the impressions that have been collected over the years. So the idea is that by the time you're five, your general disposition for how you will be for the rest of your life is determined. And it's determined based on how much stroking you receive. So, if from the age, from when you're born to the age of five, you've been receiving a lot of nurturing and love, physical connection, you know, then that's what's considered stroking and that's good for your health. That will help you develop a healthy ego. Whereas if you get neglected or ignored, or worse, if you get abused, this is what can lead to a hazardous 
identity, a hazardous ego. And there are four basic temperaments, four dispositions that one develops from the age of to the from the age of five. And this disposition sticks with you for the rest of your life. You can adjust it, but you're pretty much stuck with this. This is like the blueprint of what's going on. So the first disposition is the I'm okay, you're okay. So I'm okay, you're okay is basically the healthy ego. It's the ego and the disposition of somebody who received enough nurturing, enough attention, positive attention, and love. You know, they weren't ignored when they were crying at length, and they weren't starved, they weren't beaten necessarily, you know, nothing in excess. Just a nice, moderate, healthy way of being raised. And I'm okay, you're okay pretty much means that they accept th themselves because they've been shown to love themselves and not feel guilty all the time or self-loathing. And you're okay because they love their parents. They've been good parents. So I'm okay, you're okay is your general healthy disposition. And those are the ones that get, get enough strokes in their life. The next one is I'm okay, you're not okay. And that is basically your general narcissist. Those that believe that they are better or more superior than everyone else. Generally, they're the ones that are raised with maybe some abuse, you know, some abuse in their life. Maybe there was enough positive influence for them to have develop a positive regard for themselves and a confident way of holding themselves. But at the same time, to learn over the years to res resent or despise or distrust others. This could be due to the parents, siblings, major influences. When, when I talk about things that happen in the first five years, it's any, anything goes. Generally, it falls on the parents and the immediate family because these are the guys, these are the people that have a, a consistent effect in your life from the get-go. So I'm not okay, uh, I'm okay, you're not okay. Is, is not the best disposition, disposition to wind up at. And it's those people that end up, you know, really just abusing people and using people, manipulating, exploiting, and they don't really have a conscience about it because they believe that they deserve the benefits of whatever they need to do, even if that means it's at the expense of anyone else. Because I'm okay, you're not okay, so fuck you. And then the other disposition is I'm not okay, you're not okay. And these are your general sociopaths, psychopaths, immoral, you know, apathetic, no emotional regard for others' well-being. And because they don't have love for themselves, self-acceptance, and they are full of self-loathing even, this means that they can do all manners of things atrocious and transgressive without it weighing in on their moral conscience simply because there is no moral conscience when you hate everything you know including yourself when you are raised in abuse constant and constantly being put down and constantly being judged without barely enough positive influence in your life that's where you have a great chance of winding up at by the age of five I'm not okay, you're not okay. And it's probably the worst disposition. And the last disposition, because there's only four. And this is the one that we are all actually born with. One we are all actually born with. We all start with this disposition. And then if we get enough strokes and enough attention positive, we can actually change this disposition. And like I said, if it's negative attention, then it can change for the worse. But the one that we all start with, and this is where first impressions last a lifetime comes into it, is I'm not okay, you're okay. I'm not okay, you're okay. And that's your basic victim. You know, the majority of people, at least a large portion, probably if you divide these four groups up, the biggest group will be the I'm not okay, you're, you're okay people. These are the insecure people that 
have such low self-esteem and low self-belief and self-confidence, self-love, self-acceptance, that they seek to be saved by others, that they seek other people that they look up to, that they admire, that they like role models and idols, they can become infatuated, you know, obsessed with other people, and they seek their approval. Almost as if these people's acceptance and recognition and praise helps them praise themselves and be able to accept themselves and recognize the good in themselves. It's not something they can find on the inside because they just feel so bad. They've actually got to try to find, find it through the approval of others. You know, the I'm not okay, you're okay. These people expect, you know, these are the sex addicts that use sex with other people in order to escape their pain. You know, or even if it's not sex, but just through relationships and finding somebody else to make them happy because they feel so miserable and sad and, you know, by themselves that they need someone else that to them is worthwhile. Someone that brings a positive element into their life, a sense of meaning, a sense of maybe purpose. And the people that admit become ser servile, become like servants to people. With, you know, your wish is my command because they've got nothing to do for themselves. They've got to find that sense of drive, sense of cause and ambition through others. And we all start here. We all start with this insecure, you know, inadequate uh, disposition. And this is why, this is why I say first impressions truly do last a lifetime. Go back before you're born back when you're in the womb of your mother and you imagine what it's like to be back in that place where you're totally at one with your with your mom and there is no separation you're together in complete and utter union union and unity and it's comfortable there there's no loud noises you know it's very warm feel the beat of your mother's heart every single beat you are there with your heart beating right next to hers and you're there for quite some time in this cocoon where you were just in peace relative I mean like I said if there's loud noises on the outside or bumps that obviously will affect the fetus otherwise it's a relatively chilled place to be for nine months and then all of a sudden you are ejected into a world of harsh bright lights and loud noises and you're separate from your mother and you can no longer hear a heartbeat and you have this sense of gravity the sense of falling the sense of void well opposite of void you were in the void you were in a place of total peace and now it's a state of being overwhelmed by all the sensory data. A sense of self outside of whatever the fuck you just came out of. You've got no clue. Co to compound the fact, considering, you know, the most peaceful way to be born is in water. That's why I do believe in home births. But when you're born in a hospital and you're taken away from your mum within moments of being birthed, just to be stuck in a plastic container with bright lights everywhere, surrounded by the cries of other babies, perchance. It's not the best first impression. It's not the best first impression outside of the womb and into life, into the womb of life, so to speak. It's not the best first impression and it will last a lifetime. No wonder, no wonder we all start off with this, I'm not okay, I'm afraid, I need help, disposition. Because from a place of total peace and love and unity, we are divorced and forced into a world of separateness, being alone, with all these bright lights, and it's, it's not pleasant. You know, maybe if we were all born in water, and then held at length by our mom so that we weren't totally separated at birth and then left there alone in a, in a, in a, in a box. Maybe, maybe we wouldn't start off with the I'm not okay, you're okay disposition. Who knows? 
the general way it's been for a long time is, in at least our part of the world, is that you're taken away and you're chucked in a box. And the way that our world is with people working, you know, part-time, full-time jobs, having to make ends meet, having to have daycare on the side, it can be hard to make sure your child gets enough stroking, gets enough physical attention, and even just mental and emotional attention, so that you can bring it back into that space of feeling at one with you, back into that space of not feeling separate and alone, but feeling united and safe and comfort. And that's the basic idea, is that we come from that space of safety and comfort and security. And then no wonder we feel insecure, you know, the way that we're born into a world and alone. And it's, it could be a traumatizing experience. And for most people, most babies, it is. And it lasts a lifetime. So when we have a child, the main aim, the main important thing is, at least up until the age of five, not that I'm saying you should stop, once they turn five. But up until the age of five, is to make sure you make that child feel loved and try to bring it back to that space. Feeling safe, in peace, at one with its family, you know? The more that you ignore it, the child, and the more that you shout, you know, the, more, the less you spend time doing quality things, but just connecting the less it will feel that its, its gap is being bridged. And that gap will just keep increasing until it feels totally alone and separate. And that's why everyone's got self-inadequacy issues. Apparently, according to transactional analysis, this whole PAC thing. So to recap, we're born into this world from this disposition and we start recording everything emotionally, everything mentally, until the age of five, where these rational centers develop in our brains, which then gives us the ability to play DJ over our stream of thoughts and stream of emotions collected over time. And we can actually start making new conscious decisions instead of just being reactive to our emotions and mental, mental conditioning, emotional impressions. The idea, the benefits of PAC, the benefits of transactional analysis is that a lot of people are either stuck in their parent most of the time or stuck in their child most of the time. There's always going to be a one that's pre predominant over the other. And we're always changing between the states. Sometimes we'll be totally emotionally reactive and we will react in the same way that we have been conditioned to as a child up until the age of five where our disposition was set. There's other times where we'll just react to what we know, to our set ways, our set behaviors and traditions as passed on or even from our parents and developed through childhood. You know, we'll, we'll find ourselves echoing the same sentiments and the same reasoning that our parents and those that raised us and our major influences imparted on us consistently. You know, it gets passed along. So, those who predominantly react from their, their parent, from the mental conditioning, you'll find are more judgmental. You know, the parent is the one that gives commands and tells you how it is. It knows the answers. You know, the child is the one that asks, uh, that quite cries and plays the blame game. You know, or feels sad, oh, poor me poor me and it gets all emotional and irrational you know so and then the adult comes into it and the idea is that just by being aware of in any given situation when you're reacting to something if somebody says something, you know it triggers either response and you start just emotionally reacting or like mentally reacting you can actually go hang on a second and you can observe what's going on in this internal dialogue in this internal cassette and you can say, well, actually, I'm saying this or I'm feeling like this because of this. Because I'm in my child right now. Because I'm in my parent. I'm in my heart space, my head space. Just by being aware of that, and this is the benefit, just by being aware of how and why you're reacting the way you are, 
you're automatically catapulted into the adult position with your hands on the, on the controls and you have full control. Once again, instead of just being reactive, you can now afford to become proactive and make a new choice instead of just reacting to the past impressions, conditioning, you can determine a, a different possibility, a different action, different behavior, and which can be a lot more beneficial than just repeating the same old stuff from the past, just learning how to evolve our game and develop new methods and adapt to the, to the future needs and the present needs, especially. So that's the idea. If you're in an argument with someone and someone says something that makes you feel defensive all of a sudden, really defensive, even really angry, you know, or anxious, instead of just reacting about it and going with it and letting it just build up like a snowball, the idea is to catch yourself out and say, hang on a second, why am I feeling so strong about that? You know, that person just said that. That person just did that. You know, people have said other stuff along the same lines in terms of its, you know, severity or whatever. Why am I reacting so strongly to that? And just by thinking about it and questioning it and being able to assess the situation and seeing, you know, maybe it's because throughout my childhood or throughout my life, because, you know, all the mental and emotional conditioning still after the age of five, it still makes a difference. It still adds to your overall pool of mental reactions and emotional reactions. So you might think, oh, well, I'm feeling upset about that because I, I always used to get called that in school. I used to, used, used to get called that by my brother and now they call me the same thing and that's why I'm so angry. It's got nothing to do with them and this present information. It's to do with old information that they a triggering or the similar event is arousing and that's the idea instead of us becoming prisoners chained to the past and our past ways of reacting and feeling and thinking instead of us being a loop we can actually break that chain break that loop break that trap escape it entirely that prison and we can go okay I'm gonna engage now with what's happening now. I'm gonna assess this information and what's going on and the people in it instead of painting these people with my demons past. Instead of painting the situation with my fears past or my failures. If you keep painting the present with all your failures past, you'll never see the opportunity to win. To truly win and you'll never win. People that just play on repeat, they don't really move forward so much. They just perfect their methods of playing their dramas and playing their scenes that they've been cycling through in their life. And you get people like that, that they're quite content, it seems, not moving forward. Or maybe they're just not aware enough that they're even on a cycle, you know, drama thing, got a drama going on, or a loop, a behavioral loop. So that's the idea. Now there's another interesting thing with transactional analysis, and I'm not ultimately cleared up in every aspect of transactional analysis, which is the analysis of human transactions and interactions, basically. But I understand bits and pieces. One interesting bit, bit and piece is that there are two kinds of people, predominantly. I think there's a third somewhere in the middle, the healthier one, but I, I do understand the extremes. So, you have, imagine three circles now. So you got the P, the A, and the C, the parent, the adult, and the child, right? So you've got the child down here, which is your emotions. You've got your mental conditioning. There's two tapes with all this data on it from the past. And then you've got the adult here, which is moving forward. And that's your, the, the terms they actually use in transaction analysis is the computer, the adult computer. And the child and the parent, they call archaic information. Archaic information, which means outdated or old information. So you've the old information of your parent and your child and you've got the computer and I guess they call it the com computer. Can I know Mark's running on time or not, yeah? Yep. Hopefully I'll just be about And I guess they call it the computer because it has the ability to analyse this old information and you know, determine new possibilities from it. Which is kind of what a computer does. So, 
Imagine those three circles, PAC, archaic information, and then computer, right? Which is your current generator. Um, sorry, I just got distracted there. So when we're, when we're being raised, you have people that their child, you know, their child starts to overlap their adult. So, you know, maybe they were raised, you know, where their parents ignored them a lot and the parents never really answered their questions when they asked them about, you know, what's this, what's that, why does that happen? So they had to figure out a lot of things out themselves and they were just wandering around in a big, big world and they weren't really given guidance on how to be practical, how to do things. We don't really talk too much. So, you know, and especially if these if these people did suffer abuse, or were constantly in an anxious or stressful environment, then this may also attribute to this way of winding up, way of being. And basically, you know, this all of this, the stressful environment, and the not being taught how to be practical, and not being reasoned with, even taught the idea of reasoning can help develop the child to the point where the parent isn't even in there much, the ability to judge and give answers. But it, it becomes all about just emotionally relating to everything and that becomes a predominant way that the person relays information and communicates. It's just on an emotional level. So what you get when there is an overlap between the emotional and the adult, which is the ability just to be clear and to ra rationalize, when there's, when there's an overlap and they start becoming enmeshed and merging, you get the delusional child, or the delusional person. As, and that's pretty much what they call it in transactional analysis. So, and you get a lot of people like that, a lot of people that are a bit unrealistic, a bit dreamy, impractical, and they, they just react based on their emotions more and their impulses, and that's what governs them. It's probably because they weren't raised to have a strong parent, they weren't raised to, to know so much and be able to answer things so much. They weren't taught so much in terms of how to be reasonable, and maybe they were always in a really emotional environment, stressful environment. Or maybe they weren't disciplined enough. You know, you can still have a happy life, but just not be disciplined and still not learn enough. So you're always, always going based on your emotional motivations and what used to make you happy. And that's what you keep chasing for the rest of your life. And you might become delusional because your, your parent and your adult wasn't developed so much. It wasn't encouraged that you look, learn how to learn. It wasn't encouraged that you learn how to figure things out yourself and use your adult computer and reason and be rational. So on the other side of the fence, you've got the delusional person here, which is the child overlapping the adult, or the emotional impressions overlapping the ability to presently analyze information and determine responses. And that's what the base of the adult is. On the other extreme, you've got the judgmental person, the judgmental person. And that's when the parent overlaps the child. So if there's, let's say, an older sister or an older brother in a family, and let's say their parent happens to be a little bit neglectful, and maybe they take drugs or a lot of pharmaceuticals, they have a drinking problem. And they can't really take the, the response, they're not meeting the needs of the children, and they're not taking full responsibility the way that they should be. And so as a result of this, the sibling, the older sibling, has to end up playing parent themselves and changing the nappy more than the mother does, or just as much, you know, doing the shopping maybe, keeping things in order. And, and that, Okay, so when you have people like this, people that were raised to constantly be telling someone, you know, what to do, constantly being raised of having to manage things, you know, and make sure that they're keeping everything in order, having to think all the time, 
deal with responsibility and having to control. I mean, that's really what the, the parent does. The parent, the mental, it's all about learning how to control things. The need to control, the need to give answers and say, that's how it's done. That's the conclusion. Whereas a child moans and complains and is irrational about it, the parent gives the answers and the adult asks questions. It's the only way to learn. It's the only way to grow. It's the only way to understand the present situation because every situation is different in the now. If you want to understand it, you got to ask questions about it. You got to be open to it. A lot of people won't even do that. They won't even use their adult and try to analyze the current information and ask questions so that they can answer it with new information. They'll just react to the old information. That's what the parent does. People that were raised to constantly, you know, be like authority figures in a sense in their own home. They end up finding it very hard to let go because their parent has contaminated their adult. There's an overlap there and it's meshed. So instead of being able to be totally clear and totally in their adult, just like the delusional person, they're always got a little bit of their parent, just like they have a little bit of that the child and a little bit of the emotions getting into their rationale. These people, you know, it's very hard to let go, relax, enjoy life, to ride out with a feeling before starting to think, okay, how do I control this? What do I need to do? What do I need to be responsible for, you know? And always be on guard. So if you meet people, you know, and they might be, like I said, delusional or impractical or dreamy, and not organized and really impulsive, or if you meet someone, they're, they're control freaks and judgmental, you know, and they tell you what to do and they think they have all the answers. And it's hard for them to relax and they're always busy, busy, busy in this mentality. Before you judge them, understand, or and maybe ask them questions so you can further your understanding, that maybe it's their past, that it, or definitely it's their past that has led them to be this way. And maybe it's through the development of their, you know, the amount of emotional input they had and the, the amount that they had basically had to use their head versus the amount that they had to, or the amount that they did use their heart. If you had someone that had really emotional upbringing without much reason at all, of course they're gonna end up being in a place of emotions and fear or just unrealistic joy, you know? Not that that's a bad thing, unrealistic joy. I mean, what is unrealistic joy, you know? Unless you have people that are like becoming infatuated with the other people that are trying to escape them. They're like, oh, they love me, they love me, and they keep chasing after them. And then a few restraining orders later, finally the joy ceases. The person actually realizes, oh, you know, this wasn't meant to be. I don't love you anymore. You can't have me. I know you love me. You can't have me. You get some delusional people out there. You know, so that's the basic idea. Now, is another way that you can use this. If you're in an interaction with someone, imagine there's two people and each people have their, their three circles. They've got the P, the A, and the C, P-A-C, the computer, and then the archaic information. Now, if you have a parent talking to the child, or let's say, no, let's say, let's say, okay, uh, the wife comes home, and she asks the husband, you know, where have you put the keys? And the husband responds, you know, all right, I, 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 uh, that's, that's a bad example. Let me re reiterate that. Um, okay, so as an example of how this actually applies to transactions between people or interactions, the father comes home, or husband, and asks the wife, darling, have you seen my keys anywhere? And she responds, oh, you idiot. If you put them in the same place every time, you know where to find them you fool. And suddenly, what happens here is instead of this dialogue advancing, the situation improving and him finding the keys, instead, he's asked her, using his adult, he's asked her, do you know where the keys are? It's just a question. Adult asks questions. She's come, instead of responding reasonably with an answer directly or a question, she's responded from a parent position and totally just shut him down, right? And basically at this point, this is what in, in transactional analysis one would call a crossed transaction. Which means, 
you know, imagine there's a line connecting the adult to the adult, which is basically what the, the husband was trying to do with the wife, just communicate to that place of just rationality. And she's come from a, you know, maybe a, maybe when she was a child, if she misplaced something, her parents would just be like, you're a fool, you should be more organized. So she replies with that, because that's her mental conditioning. And she's talking down to his child. So there's a line connecting the parent to the child, and a line from his adult to her adult. So it's a cross transaction. Bam! Whenever there is a cross transaction, there is no way to resolve the situation. There's no way to advance it, and it acts as a block. So the best thing to do, if you're in an argument with somebody, if you're in any kind of interaction, and you're trying to be reasonable, you try not to react to your emotions, you try not to react to your mental conditioning, but you're trying to, you know, assess the situation realistically now, in present tense, and trying to advance by, you know, asking questions and figuring out new options of what to do. If you try to take this approach and somebody starts shutting you down and getting judgmental, or on the other hand, if somebody starts getting emotional about it and taking offense and defending themselves and acting like a child because you've triggered something, that's what you call a crossover. Uh, you know, instead of trying to push it, which is only going to cause more frustration, more pain, more anger. The best thing to do whenever there is a cross transaction and you can't get a two-way adult to adult thing going, is to step back and go, okay, let's pick this up later. Let's leave it for now. It's the best approach to take. You can't force a broken transaction. You know, because at that point, when you've asked a question, you're trying to figure something out, you know, and they shut you down, you know, that's the end of it. You know, you can't ask any more questions, you know, because they're, they're not in that space to be an adult with you and try to inquire or, or figure it out with you. It's just going to be more judgment, more frustration. So the best thing to do is to go away and come back to it later. You know, whether it's a relationship, having an argument or anything. Another thing you can try and do, if the person you're with has an understanding of PAC, parent, adult, child, then if you say something and you just so happen to hook someone's child or you hook someone's parent and they understand what these concepts mean, then you can say to them straight out, look, I didn't mean to hook your child or I didn't mean to hook your parent. I'm just trying to talk adult to adult and understand the situation. Now they've used this for a lot of studies and it's, it's had particular success in a lot of it across the field, but particularly it's very useful for kids with disabilities and people with disabilities because it's a simple concept, you know? You have a heart space, a head space, and then the irrationality in the middle of being able to figure out, you know, instead of just reacting to either, maybe a synthesis of both or just an objective approach, you know, how do I respond to the situation? It's a very simple concept that's easy for most people to get their heads around. So, a children it's good to use with if, you know, if they end up getting upset about something defensive or angry, instead of you saying, hey, stop being an idiot or stop acting childish or, you know, stop being mean, stop being a bully, you know, because people don't like to be judged. People don't like to take full responsibility for misbehaving or doing something wrong or being flawed. And generally, people will naturally reject those things and find evidence to suggest the other person is wrong and that they are okay. So, by saying to somebody that, look, you're getting angry now, you're, you're getting emotional right now, it's not because it's your fault. It's not because you are flawed or acting like this or that, but it's because instead of somebody having to take the whole blame upon themselves, which no one wants to do, they can actually take just partial blame. It kind of divides the blame. It's kind of like saying, well, really, you're the adult. That's who I'm talking to when I'm talking to you, is the adult. It's the you that resides and presides above your child and parent. It's the rational self. And that's really who I'm talking to, with all respect. But right now, at this moment, your child is hooked. 
an emotional impression, reaction, an impression based reaction, or a mental conditioning based reaction is being hooked right now. And I'm just letting you know I didn't mean to do that, or that is inappropriate, or that's not necessary. Approaching it from this angle, using this concept, does allow one to be like, okay, well, he's talking to me, he's talking to my adult, and yeah, okay, I was just acting like a child, or I was just acting a bit judgmental, like a parent, but just, I don't know, it's like, you know, they can then go, well, I'm not my child, I'm not my parent, it's not me that they're judging in my entirety, but it's just a mode that I've fallen into, a mode that was activated, which I can now choose to deactivate. I don't know, you, you, I guess you just don't feel as responsible for it. You know, instead of someone heaving all the blame onto you, you fucked up, you can say, well, you were just you, reacting to your emotions, but you're back with us now, your rational self, it's all good, you're okay. You're okay, I'm okay. And that's the basic idea. You know, so if your child's upset with something, or not understanding, or angry, you can say, look, I think you're acting from your child right now. And you've got to be careful. If no one understands the concepts and the terminology, of course they're going to take offense. They might even use it against you. Oh, my adults, your adults. You know, they think you're condescending them. You know, talking about child and parent. If they understand the concept, then just by saying them, look, I think you're reacting with your child right now and I'm trying to speak to your adult, automatically that pushes them into an objective space where they are reviewing their child and their parent and actually considering, well, is what he just said true? As soon as you say that, they have to think about it. Just by thinking about it, they're removing themselves out of those spaces of child and parent and they're automatically activating the adult, which is you know, the rational overhead view of everything, which will allow them a lot more space and a better pace to arrive at a more clear um, and mature reaction, a more appropriate reaction. So yeah, that's the basic idea of uh, transactional analysis and uh, parent adult child is that, you know, we all throughout time, we accumulate all these different impressions here and here. And the idea is not to become too stuck in either one, where we're using one, using our heart, we're using our head too much, using our child or our parent. But we want to have the ability to move outside of that. Not all the time. You don't want to be in your adult all the time because being a child has its place. You couldn't experience joy without your child, you know? You couldn't experience being in control and, and organizing and building something, working on projects and towards cause and planning progress without the, the, the parent, in effect, because it's your parent which keeps you disciplined. It's the disciplinary voice. But when it goes out of control, and it starts trying to discipline everyone else, cane like style, and calling all the shots, like a big gun, you know, but when the child goes out of control, doesn't take responsibility, and just wants to have fun all the time, that's when you really need to get an adult cranking, you know what I'm saying? That's when you need to get the adult into the room. Start listening to the input of that. So yeah, I hope you found this, uh, this talk useful. Just in understanding, you know, that you are made up of three parts, really. You know, the, ju the dual yin-yang emotional mental aspects, all of which is you know, based on your past up until the very point now, accumulative, especially in your childhood years, first five years. And that you're also your third aspect, your adult, which is you. You, besides the conditioning, beneath and behind all the impressions, is you. And you have the capacity and the ability, possibility, to do anything, to realize or determine new things and to change your life completely. The more you learn to gain control of your adult while appropriately letting yourself experience your parent and your child and react from those spaces, the more you learn to use your adult and objectively overlook your, your, the way you're feeling and thinking, 
the more you'll understand yourself, control yourself and master yourself as a puppet on strings, and the better you can advance that puppet forward on this stage of life. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, that's it. So I'm gonna go up now. I'm gonna be a bit of a child, cause you know, me, myself, I'm a bit of a child overlapping parent just because of my upbringing. So I'm a very emotional, kind of impulsive, not the best with discipline. Uh, and I'm not very judgmental. Uh, you know, it works. And I like to think that my adult is pretty pretty well there. I've got a good grip. I've got a good awareness, at least, of where my head's at and the, the, all the, the tape of the recordings in my head and the, the strip of my heart. I've, you know, I like to think. I like to think that I'm not too reactive most of the time. Anyways, I'm off now to play, have some fun, and then, yeah, on, on goes the show. Cheers for watching, guys, and stay tuned for more talks. Uh, there's some walking and talking segments you can check out. It's me just yarring about random bollocks. Otherwise, uh, take care of yourself and fair tidings, eh? Thanks for watching.